Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. And before we start this morning, I'd like to have prayer and ask the Lord's blessing before we delve into this topic today. Our Father in heaven, thank you for another Sabbath that we can be here together. I ask for your blessing this morning as you open your word and study this topic. May, may it be your word that's lifted up and may it be you that we listen to this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're going to be talking about, uh, I told, chose the title, and it's actually uh, directly from one of the quotations, we'll see it later. Heavenly character must be acquired on earth. The scripture reading is one of my favorites, 2 Peter 1, 4. If we're going to have a heavenly character, I've learned and this is from my own self and experience, that it's very important that I be a partaker of the divine nature. So I chose it for that reason, and it's one of my favorite scriptures that I use that uh, whenever I'm facing um, a situation where Satan is trying to dis derail me from developing a heavenly character. Um, I use this scripture and repeat it uh, to myself over and over if need be to where I, the, the uh, temptation fades and no longer is annoying me. But uh, I seek to be a partaker of the divine nature at all times. This is what I'm learning. Here is this quotation that talks about character building. At this time, a very decided work in character building should be going forward among our people. We are to develop before the world the characteristics of the Savior. Let that sink in a little bit. It is impossible to please God without the exercise of genuine, sanctifying faith. We are individually responsible for our faith. True faith is not a faith that will fail under test and trial. It is the gift of God to his people. Faith is very important, and faith is what I've learned is required in order to be sanctified, which is a process that needs to be uh, continued as long as we live. It's not just you're sanctified and you're done. It needs to continue as long as we live. and so. Character building is extremely important, and faith is faith in God's promises, such as that first promise, first, uh, 2 Peter 1, 4. And true faith, true faith is truly a gift of God to his people. I love this promise, Christ Object Lesson 69. Paragraph one, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. And the church is not a building, it's his people. 
the ones who accepted Christ and are having Christ's character reproduced in them, because that's what it talks about. He is waiting with long desire for the manifestation of himself and his church, his people, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in the people, his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. This implies that this hasn't happened yet. We haven't allowed Christ to reproduce his character perfectly in us. Otherwise, according to this, he would have come and claimed us as his own. So this points out something that we need. If we really are interested in having Christ come and claim us as his own, this points out that there's something that we have been lacking in doing. Because Personally, I don't, when I read this, I understand it to say and mean what it says. When his character is perfectly reproduced in me, in you, in you, in you, he will come to claim us as his own. He hasn't come to claim us as his own. Therefore, the logical conclusion is his character hasn't been perfectly reproduced. He's still waiting for that to happen, is what I get from this. There are many who, though striving to obey God's commandments, have little peace or joy. This lack in their experience is the result of a failure to exercise faith. They walk, as it were, in a salt land, a desert, a parched wilderness. Not a good place to go walking in. If you get thirsty, what are you going to do? They claim little when they might claim much. For there is no limit to the promises of God. Amen? Such ones do not correctly represent the sanctification that comes through obedience to the truth. We're misrepresenting God. We're misrepresenting faith. We're misrepresenting sanctification. We claim little when we could claim much. We could have gone home. If we want to go home, it's time we do something about it. The Lord would have all his sons and daughters happy, peaceful, and obedient. Through the exercise of faith, the believer comes into possession of these blessings. Where do the blessings come from? The exercise of faith. Yes, faith. Through faith, through faith, every deficiency of character may be supplied. Are you struggling to overcome something in your life? Do you have difficulty at times? Through faith, every deficiency of character may be defined. We're trying to build, or we're on probation to build a character that's fit for heaven. Christ hasn't come to take us to heaven yet. Why? We don't have a character fit for heaven yet. Through faith, 
Every deficiency of character may be supplied. Every defilement cleansed. Do you have any defilement in your life? Through faith. Every fault corrected. Do you have some faults that need to be corrected? Through faith. Every excellence developed. Do you want to develop some excellences? Through faith. Now this I'm going to share with you is something that's my own personal reflections. This is not a quotation. That's why it's not on the screen. I've come to this conclusion. How can anyone live by faith if they have not memorized at least some of the promises of Scripture? I found this to be true in my life. Whenever I'm faced with temptation, if I forget to use the promises that I have memorized, I'm toast. Satan always wins. The only way that I can win and resist temptation, anyone know? Anyone have any idea? How did Christ resist? Scripture. It is written. How can you use Scripture to resist temptation, though, if you don't know it even? If Christ didn't previously know Scripture, could he have used it to resist the temptations in the wilderness? Then why do we think that we can? So I have found it impossible to resist the devil's temptations if I have not memorized the promises that tell me how to resist the devil. Such as 2 Peter 1.4. I need to know the scriptures that will allow me to resist the devil so that he will flee from me. It is written is the only language that makes the devil tremble and flee. Would you agree? Amen. That's right. It's nothing I can say will make him flee. Only it is written. Only. If I have not memorized scripture promises, there's no way that I can overcome the devil's temptations. There is no way that I can build a character that is fit for heaven. This is what I'm learning. It is a great thing to believe in Jesus. We hear many say, Believe, believe. All you have to do is believe in Jesus. Have you heard that said? But it is our privilege to inquire, what does this belief take in and what does it comprehend? There are many of us who have a nominal faith. Anyone know what nominal means? <laughs> we have a little bit of faith. But we do not bring that faith into our characters. We're trying to build a strong character with just a little bit of faith. That's like trying to build a house with just a little bit of lumber. About the only thing you'll be able to manage maybe is an outhouse. It takes a lot of faith to build a character that is based on the life of Christ. 
the statement is made that the devil believed and trembled. He knows, he understands. While he was in heaven, he believed that Christ was the Son of God. He knew it. He just didn't like it. And when upon this earth, he was in conflict with him here on the field of battle. He knew. He understood what he was dealing with. We need to bring, by faith, into our character building, we need to bring in Christ. We need to truly believe in what he can do to help us construct a character that will withstand tempest and storm. The devil, again here, finishing that quotation, he believed on Christ, but could this save him? No because he did not weave Christ into his life and character. And do you know that most of us, many of us, either at some time in our life or still doing so? No different, because the devil knows how to tempt us to do very similar to what he has done with his life. We must have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. It's not just love, love, love. Believe, believe, believe. We have to be purified. And this belief in Christ will lead us to put away what? Everything that is offensive in his sight. You know, this is the time of the year when as accountants or business owners you go through and do what's called inventory. It's coming up. You go and count everything that you use in your business because the government wants to know if you actually have what you claim on your tax return, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we don't need to go over that anymore. But um, We really, what we need to do as Christians, because we're doing character building, right? That's what this topic is about. That's what this scriptures and quotations are talking about is character building. We need to run, um, we need to do an inventory and see what we're using to build. Are we using satanic delusions to build? No, of course not. We wouldn't do that. But we need to take an inventory. Is everything we're using to build with, is it based on faith in Christ and Christ alone? Or we shall let some satanic delusions creep in. We must have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. And this belief in Christ will lead us to put away everything that is offensive in his sight. If we do an inventory and we find there's things in our life that is offensive to Christ's life, do you think we're going to go home to heaven with him when he comes? Unless we have this faith that works, it is of no advantage to us. You may admit that Christ is the Savior of the world. We would agree to that, I would think. Christ is the Savior of the world, right? But is he your Savior? Is he your savior? 
Do you believe today that he will give you strength and power to overcome every defect in your character? Or are we just going to go on with little defects of character? Don't, don't worry about them. Just believe. Just have love. Just be kind. Just be nice. God will overlook the little defects of character. He's going to let us all into heaven. I mean, after all, we've been keeping the Sabbath for years. We are to grow up to the full stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. And we are thus growing up a precious temple unto the Lord. He says, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Is he going to claim us as his own if his character isn't perfectly reproduced in us? If we're building with bad timbers, rotten boards, will he claim us as his own? Will he call us his people? It makes every difference with us whether we are living righteously or in sin. To some of us, Christ may say that he is ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. But to those who are loaded down with burdens, the pity and savor stands right by their side to help them. And I considered this, the loaded down with burdens, that's those who are striving to live righteously. They're the ones that are loaded down with burdens. It's not hard to be a sinner. You can be a sinner without even trying. But to live righteously, our Savior will help us if we're trying, struggling to live righteously. He will give us the help that we need. There must be a greater striving in you to overcome every failure and sin and to stand right before God. There are many today who might be far in advance of what they now are had they had this faith. We've been lacking this faith. The faith that will enable us to overcome every defect of character and build a solid character. Now we talk about the foundation. We need Christ is our foundation. God wants us to be standing upon the platform of eternal truth. And he would have us in that position where our lives will preach to the world that they must love God and keep his commandments if they shall ever enter heaven. Anyone here wanting to enter heaven? Anyone here planning to enter heaven? Then we must comply with the conditions for entering heaven. We must be building and standing upon a platform of eternal truth, not a platform with rotten timbers. The spirit warreth against the flesh. His servants ye are to whom you yield obedience. And when his spirit shall cleanse the soul temple, then Christ will come in and dwell there. He won't come in where he's not wanted. If we're serving Satan, even in small things, don't expect Christ to dwell in us. We have to give up those things that we know don't belong in our lives. Nothing but holiness will prepare you for heaven. It is sincere experimental piety alone that can give you a pure, elevated character. 
and enable you to enter into the presence of God who dwelleth in light unapproachable. The heavenly character must be acquired where? That's where we are now. If we're planning to go to heaven, we've got to acquire the heavenly character here now. Or if it's not acquired here on earth, it can never be acquired at all. This is it, folks. This is the only place you can acquire, build that heavenly character. If we don't get it here before we die, or Christ comes, we're not going to heaven. You won't be going to heaven. You'll be going some other place. And it's not a pleasant place to be. At least that's what scripture makes it pretty clear. Desires for goodness and true holiness are right so far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. Good purposes are right, but will prove of no avail unless resolutely carried out. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians, but they made no earnest effort. Therefore, they will be weighed in the balances and found wanting. The will must be exercised in the right direction. It's the will. That's the part that we can control. Trying harder isn't the answer. It's the will. It's surrendering to Christ. True character is not shaped from without and put on. It radiates from within. If we wish to direct others in the path of righteousness, the principles of righteousness must be enshrined in our own hearts. Our profession of faith may proclaim the theory of religion, but it is our practical piety that holds for the word of truth. The consistent life, the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity, the active benevolent spirit, the godly example, these are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. Notice it doesn't say through going out and holding evangelistic meetings. It's our lives that people look at. Sinful indulgent defiles the body and unfits men for spiritual worship. He who cherishes the light which God has given him upon health reform has an important aid in the work of becoming sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality, fitted for heaven. But if he disregards that light and lives in violation of natural law, he must pay the penalty. His spiritual powers are benumbed, and how can he perfect holiness in the fear of God? Now, I'm going to add to this my own conclusion, something I've learned. If I'm ever going to perfect holiness in the fear of God, I must eat and drink as if I am already living in heaven. If I do not eat and drink now as if I will be eating and drinking if I make it to heaven, I'm never going to be in heaven. Why are we living as if we would like to stay here on this earth? We talk about going to heaven. We really do. We talk as if we're trying to prepare to go to heaven. Yet we live as if we want to stay here on earth. 
Christ said of the Spirit, He shall glorify me. As Christ glorified the Father by the demonstration of his love, so the Spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing to the world the riches of his grace. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Satan says it's impossible to find uh, anyone who can live perfectly without sinning. God says, I can. He's looking for a few good people who will, <laughs> who will vindicate his character, who will build upon his character the perfection of the character of his people. The religion of Christ means more than the forgiveness of sin. It means that sin is taken away. The idea out there that all you need to do is ask for forgiveness. You need to ask for forgiveness, but that's not all. Sin has to be taken away. And that the vacuum, when you take sin away out of your life, what do you do? How do you live your life? If you no longer do those things that you used to do. The vacuum has to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. It means that the mind is divinely illumined, that the heart is emptied of self and filled with the presence of Christ. When this work is done for church members, the church will be a living, working church. We want to be a living, working church. I'm sure of that. But are we really doing what needs to happen in order to be that way? As the dew and the rain are given, first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. Not partially, not somewhat, not mostly. Holy. Holy as in W-H-O-L-L-Y, but also H-O-L-Y. We must be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. Nothing less than that will qualify us for a place in heaven. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and cleansed for the indwelling of the spirit. The spirit won't dwell in a heart that's not been emptied of every defilement. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work, only in greater degree, must be done now. Then the human agent had only to ask for the blessing and wait for the Lord to perfect the work concerning him. It is God who began the work, and he will finish his work, making man complete in Jesus Christ. But we have to give him permission. We have to stop trying to hang on to those sinful habits that we know don't belong in our lives. Because if we keep hanging on to them, we'll be staying here on this earth with them. Well, that covers what I wanted to share with you this morning. It, uh, it's a very strong, very, um, it's a message that is important, needs to be said, but it's one that we probably don't like to hear very much. It's not exciting, it's not a, it's not one where you, um, you know, you, there's a work for us to do if we really truly want to be ready for Christ's coming and have a place in heaven, we need to go home and take inventory. 
what am I doing in my life? And then compare, make a list. Compare what you're doing in your life and then sit down with scripture and spirit of prophecy and take a look. Can you find that anything that says that that is something that will be done in heaven? Some of them will be real simple and easy. You'll just say, look at it and you'll say, I know that it isn't going to be in heaven. Others, you may have to take a little effort, put a little effort into it and search for it. I encourage and urge each one of you to do that. If not today, soon. Who knows if you will have, how many days we'll have. So that's, that's the presentation for the day. I know it's not the one that gets you all so excited. I'm sorry about that. But at the same time, I couldn't honestly not present this to you. It has to be said. We have to know. We have to understand. I don't want you to tell me at some point when it's too late saying, you knew and you didn't tell me? Well, today I not only told you, but I really pressured, pressed it upon you because I want to see you all there. I really do. I really do. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions